morning. Can you all Good hear morning. me? Good morning. Yes. Thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, great. Good morning and welcome to Jackson Community Church. It's the first Sunday of February and just a quick reminder that today is communion. So if you do not have your communion elements, perhaps while I'm doing announcements or, yeah, that would be best because we'd like you to be with us for the centering music so that you can just relax. Um, a quick run through of upcoming events. Everybody knows that today is the Super Bowl, so you can all tell me who you're um, rooting for later on. We have a couple of events happening this week that we wanted to call your attention to. There is a PBS special this week that I've shared a link with you by email for um, about the Black Church, that's part of Black History Month, although we know that this is actually our history, not just Black history, it's the history of all of us. There's a special program being put on by our church called A Year of Birds with Lori Kinsey. That's on Tuesday, February 9th at 6.30. So if you're interested in birds, she's prepared a special program just for us and she'll try to cover birds you might encounter over the course of the year, particularly here in New England. And we have a PCA meeting. That's a Protestant Chapel Association meeting that's going to be hosted by Zoom. So I'll have to receive the Zoom link because somebody else is hosting that meeting for us. That's on February 10th, Wednesday at four o'clock. So that's for people that are members of the Protestant Chapel Association. So Probably not everybody out in the Zoom world is going to be attending that, but if you are a member and you wish to attend, um, look for more information on that. And just a reminder also that Lent begins in about 10 days. Wednesday, February 17th is the beginning of Lent. So um, look for announcements about how we will be celebrating or observing Ash Wednesday as well. Are there any other announcements for the life of the church? Not prayer requests, announcements for the life of the church right now. If so, please do um, go ahead and unmute yourselves and speak because I'm trying to scan, but I don't always catch. I think I covered it. All right. Then I'm going to invite us to go to Centering Music, and Alan will be offering us that. And so at this time, we gather up the prayers of our community, whether you're in Zoom or here in the sanctuary, we begin with your prayers of concern and then we move to your prayers of celebration. So I'm going to ask first if there are any prayers here in the sanctuary, try to keep them really brief so that I can repeat them and make them specific to people and not other stuff. Okay, there you go.
for Bob and his family for good health. And Caitlin and her asthma. Deepak, who's recovering from COVID-19, and for ministers here in the valley. These were some of the prayers from the sanctuary. Any other prayers that we want to say out loud for here in the sanctuary? Um, Alan's offering a prayer. Prayers for people um, within the congregation of Our Lady of the Mountains, which is the Catholic church for which Alan also works, and who are now experiencing COVID, and prayers for their well-being, that they will be helped and held in the light and the healing love of God, and that they shall be safe. And now within Zoom, which is spread across multiple states. Do we have any prayers of concern that you wish to lift up out loud? If so, um, Judy and Bill, it looks like you would like to say something. Yes, our grandson, Tom and Horan. You, Judy. What? You're not muted, but th there's oh, no sound. Our grandson, Tom uh, Horan. Yes, um, no. Can you type it in chat? <laughs> Yeah, try. While Judy's typing hers in chat, if she's able, we, we can hear her. Ask if there are other prayers. Okay. Yeah, we can hear Judy. Yeah, we can talking. hear Judy. Oh, okay. I, you know what, Judy? Any... Apparently, Chris can hear you. So I think actually that's my problem, not your problem. Yeah, we can all hear her. There okay. Our um, grandson, Tom Horan, is in uh, with the National Guard and he's been deployed to the Middle East for nine months. He left this week. Okay. So for Tom Horan. National Guard deployed last week. So for all those who are serving in our military and first responders and security, is that what you're saying? Oh, and Sue Kerrigan, you're raising your hand. What would you like to share? Yes, my sister-in-law and her family in California uh, have come down with COVID and Please keep them in your prayers. Thank you. Absolutely. So again, for families, all of us, are, we're one person removed really at this point from somebody that we know who has COVID. And so for those in our, our immediate community, those in our circles of friendship and neighbors and love and kindred and connection in all those different ways, we pray again for healing for stability and safety if it's possible in the midst of such outcomes. Um, again, if you have a prayer, do feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and share. Meg, go ahead. Um, I think we should lift up Sasha, who is home from her surgery, um, recovering, but now has some major eye issues that she has to address too. So. Ongoing prayers for Sasha and her long road. Right, so prayers for Sasha. Um, we have several specific individuals who are in the midst of all kinds of journeys um, with different diagnoses. Richard and Sasha are two of those, and Deanna and Judy continue to live with cancer. Several other members of our community, including Claire and Cheryl, um, are, are beyond certain kinds of treatment and, and living in other places, although actually Claire's still being actively treated. Um, and, and it doesn't go away. The, wherever you are in your journey, I, I'm only naming people that we have permission to talk about. There are many other people who've been very private about their journeys with cancer. And so when we say cancer, we are talking about a whole host of people are there other prayers of concern? My friend uh, Amanda's mother passed away and her grandmother passed away also. So. so out in Ohio, Amanda's mother and grandmother both died. So that's a whole lot of grief. And she's got pneumonia too. And she's down with pneumonia. So that's, that's a world of healing that needs to happen and just we, we ask for comfort for those who are mourning 
we know that mourning, that life continues right through this. Children, new life comes into this world. Babies are being born and people are dying. But the ways that we honor and celebrate those have changed. We cannot always gather in the same ways. We cannot always even be at the side of those we love when they are dying. And so for the ways that our rituals have changed and the times that we can't be where we most want to be, to bear witness to life in all of its forms and its comings and goings. We ask for comfort for those who remain here in this world and mourn. Other prayers of concern. We ask also for prayers for people that are in need of healing in all kinds of ways. And we're, it's going to be an ongoing ritual at this point. I would ask that you place your hands on some part of your body that needs healing for yourself or for others in this community that you know need healing. Um, eventually, we're going to cover all the parts of the body simply by doing that. But we begin at the top of the head with the skull, and we think of the spine and the neck. We think of the brain within the skull and all the ways that it's wired and needs health for mental health, for physiological challenges to the brain, such as epilepsy or Alzheimer's or other memory conditions. We think of the eyes. We think of the ears, the nose, the tongue and the teeth, the jaw and the mouth, the throat and the beginning of the GI tract, the tract that feeds us and sustains us and runs through our whole body, stomach and intestine and colon. We think of the heart, the lungs, the breasts, the lymph nodes, the liver, the kidney, the pancreas. We think of the bones of the body. We think about the joints of the body, the shoulders, the hips, the knees, the wrists, the ankles, every bone and every tendon and muscle and nerve that connects us and helps us be who we are, and the skin that wraps us all up and brings us into the presence of this world. And as we have been praying so often of late, we pray both for our own physical bodies, but we pray too for the great body of Christ, the broadly broken open that contains and flows out for all of us and connects all of us, so that we pray too for our brothers and sisters in all parts of the world. We pray for the world itself, for its healing and its wholeness, with gratitude for its diversity, and with hope for what may come. I ask now for your prayers of celebration. I have a celebration here in the sanctuary, so we'll start with that. Go ahead, Kevin. Kevin saw a medium-sized black and white woodpecker with the red head today, and he's grateful for forgiveness and grace. Are there other prayers of gratitude here in the sanctuary? Alan has one for us. Thankful for Billy's help with an upcoming musical piece. That they've been collaborating on together. Um, that you'll all be enjoying soon. And so just t uh, gratitude for the musical collaborations that have been happening in so many different ways. One of the odd gifts of COVID that these teams have formed and that we have people joining the choir from all around the state and the country. Um, the richness of life has been made greater in many ways. Other gratitudes out in Zoom, Sue. Yes. 
the joy of watching children playing hockey at the little frozen pond on Hurricane Mountain Road. What a joy. I stopped and watched laughter. It was so much fun. And that's what, that's what our community is about. It was wonderful. Nice. Children playing hockey. Excellent. Other prayers of gratitude or celebration, if you have them, um, unmute and go ahead and share. Don't wait for me. I would think there's definitely gratitude for the snow and the winter weather. If you're an outdoorsy person right now, um, at least where we are in this part of the country, it has been a tremendously wonderful gift for being outside. And so gratitude for a glimpse of the beauty that is possible in this world. Let us then gather in celebration as well. O holy God, we have lifted up in part the names of those for whom we are concerned. We lift up to the gratitude of the reminders of the gifts you offer us, music, woodpeckers, grace and forgiveness, children playing hockey, skiing or snowshoeing and being outside, coming home safe to a warm place, understanding of the gifts that we are fortunate to call our own that come to us through your grace and your love. I would ask that we all now unmute and that we pray together as the Lord first taught us, saying, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, 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 hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, will be done. Will be done. Will be done. Will be as in heaven. Give us this day, day our daily bread, and forgive us, and forgive us, us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. He does not have temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now to bring us into a place of uh, joy, we're going to sing together, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. And we will put the lyrics up on the screen for you. And Alan will be playing live. I'm hoping this, we have all the pieces and parts for this.
And I just want to check where people, I assume, <laughs> you may have to toggle between screens in order to see things. If you've got Alan on your screen, there are two pinned screens, or you do a side-by-side -side view in your top right. Um, we're doing our best to show you everything. Uh, you may have to do a little bit of navigation to see everything, though. So um, if you see Alan and you're expecting to see the words of something, go up into the view and choose side by side, OK? I'm, I, I was hearing that a couple people at least could not see the words. So I think that's a technical thing that I can't control for you. You're going to have to do some of it yourself, although the words were being shared and, and featured. Um, OK. so. Hopefully people enjoyed the song, whether you were listening or singing. And now we're going to turn to two passages from Luke to help us focus on the bird of the week, which is really the female and the male, the hen and the rooster. So listen for the hen and the rooster in these stories. From Luke 13, verses 31 through 32 and 34. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I finish my work. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. And from Luke chapter 22, verses 60 through 62, Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today. You will disown me three times. And Peter went outside and wept bitterly. Please pray with me. Oh, holy God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I want to orient us by saying that, first of all, on another Super Bowl Sunday, we would be having a Super Bowl brunch, right? Normally, we'd be gathered in the back of the church, and we'd be hanging out, eating each other's potluck. And part of the reflection from the 8 o'clock gathering this morning was that hospitality is one of the things that happens when you think about chickens, not because the chickens come out and ask you to sit with them, but because they are served as part of the meal around the world. Just in that 8 o'clock gathering, people were able to tell stories of being greeted and welcomed into homes and offered food in Asia, Central America, Africa, and North America. And in every one of those continents, chickens were a prevalent part of the sharing of food and the sitting down to a meal together. And indeed, sacraments within our church come from a place of sharing. The reason that chickens are probably so prevalent is that they've been among us as a domesticated animal for thousands of years. They descend from what's called the red jungle fowl, which comes from places like Pakistan and India and as far away as Myanmar. The earliest known domesticated chicken, according to archaeology, came from 5400 BCE in China. They're also depicted in artwork in, in around the world, really, Greece, Asia, India, uh, for thousands of years before the time of Christ. And the uh, 5 o'clock group got to see a few of those images 
in the shape of jewelry, in the shape of seals that were used on communication, in the shape of paintings, mosaics, all kinds of artwork. So chickens have been with us for a very long time. And in our own tradition, when people were thinking about chicken, they were thinking about things like Chicken Little and the sky is falling, or the little red hen who runs around trying to get all the elements for a loaf of bread and then bakes it herself. And most of the sayings that we have about chickens aren't particularly complimentary. They tend to be about cowardice or fighting or arguing. They're not, generally speaking, positive images that we have of hens. However, clearly, in the scripture, hens have a place that is unique. In Psalm 91, the idea that we will be gathered up under the wing of, of God and sheltered there is a comforting image. And whether that is the wing of a wild hen or a domesticated hen, no one can say. But in the story from Luke, when Christ is warned that Herod has it out for him, he calls Herod a fox. And then he calls himself a hen. Now Christ could have picked any image he could have picked some sort of guardian animal that would fight with the fox and defeat the fox and guard the hen house. But he called himself a hen. Christ's image is one of love and protection and companionship. Generally speaking, when a hen is calling her chicks to come and shelter her under her wings, it's because either it's raining or she may have seen the shadow of a predator pass overhead and she calls them and she sort of fluffs out her feathers and she brings all of them under her protection. As one commentator, Nadia Boltz Weber observed, this does not eliminate the danger. And so the protection or the, the moral of the story from Christ is not necessarily that the danger goes away simply because you're a faithful person. But fear, fear doesn't have to be the motivator of your choices. The opposite of fear is the call of love, the call to be under the shelter and in relationship with that love. Indeed, Christ died. Ultimately, danger came to him and love did not prevent death itself or all that led up to death, including betrayals, pain, persecution, judgment. But more came afterwards, and that is the promise of the call of love to shelter beneath the wing of Christ. I want to show you a couple of images about the hen, and then we're going to talk about the rooster which has profound place in our faith. Depicted here, you can see the rooster, I'm sorry, the hen, sheltering her chicks beneath her, beneath her wings. And then as we move forward, we see an early image of a golden hen that was the gift of Queen Theodolinda to one of the churches in Rome. Again, it's a feminine image of God, and the hen is gathered there with her chicks, all eating together around the safety of their mother. And as we move forward yet again, we see a Dutch painting that shows Christ with his followers, and he's gesturing to his side, and he's looking at a chicken. It's one of the only images that I'm aware of that shows Christ talking about how he wishes to gather up those that he loves as a mother would gather up her chicks. This gentle, loving image of how he would protect and be companion for those that he calls his own. And then I'm going to turn us with one final image 
This is the image of a hen with a, a halo surrounding her as if she were a saint because she is representing the Holy Spirit at a church on the Mount of Olives. And this is a modern mosaic that was created to represent God's self. And again, they chose this mothering image. Now let us turn to images of roosters. And we're going to think about why, why roosters would be in the imagery of our holy faith. We know that the rooster was there and that was basically the deadline. And Christ told Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. And in many, many paintings from early Renaissance medieval traditions, we see the different times that Peter denies Christ depicted over and over again, usually by a fireside, often with a maiden or a soldier. But until you see the rooster, you haven't seen the final denial. Here in this mosaic, we see Peter lifting a fa uh, hand to his face, and he's denying Christ, who's looking at him as he's being taken away, and the rooster's crowing. And we'll see a few more of these images. As we move to the next one, we see Peter, the confessor, as an old man, and there on the table, along with all the other symbols of his life, is the rooster. And as we look at the next image, we see a painting that comes, it's above a confessional in a Catholic church in Detroit, Michigan. And again, it's the image of Peter denying Christ. And in the center on a pilaster is the rooster. Over time, different popes began to choose the image of the rooster as a significant symbol of the Christian faith. Pope Leo said it was the iconic image of Christianity. And then Pope Gregory also focused on it, made it an important image. And finally, Pope Nicholas declared a papal edict that said every Christian church should have on its steeple a rooster. So if you wonder as we move forward about the symbolism of the rooster and the church, you're going to begin to see, here's an iconography of the life of St. Peter holding the keys of the church and the rooster. So again, the significance of the rooster in the life of Peter, but also he's the founder of the church, right? He's the first pope. So as we go towards the weather vanes, we begin to see the imagery of how people have taken that edict, the papal edict, and literally placed roosters at the entrance to churches all over the world. The first imaging, image I'm showing you is the most ancient the known rooster from the top of a church. It's in Brescia, Italy, and it's from the 860s, I believe. And then as we move forward, we see some more examples of weather vanes. In particular, the one I'm showing you right now comes from a tapestry. It's called the Bayou Tapestry. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. It was commissioned in the 1070s, and it tells the story of William the Conqueror invading from France into England and the end of the English kings. But what's significant about the panel that I sought out and I'm sharing with you this morning is that we're seeing Westminster Chapel. And if you look on the left hand side, you'll see a figure reaching up onto the roof and touching the rooster that was at the entrance to the Westminster Chapel and is depicted on this tapestry in tent from the 1070s. And then as we move forward, we see more symbols of the weather vane. We have some American folklore. These are from the Smithsonian. These are wooden ones, so they're very early Americana. And then we have some metal ones that we're sharing with you from different rooftops in Europe. We have a couple of sets of those to share with you. 
And so we move forward to the next one. And finally, this, this last one is also from the Smithsonian that you're looking at. But I want you to think about why. Why that symbol stands at the entrance to every church, at least for a period of time. Many American churches still do have that weather vane, our weather vane. Some of the people that were curious at 5 o'clock on Friday did look it up. Does ha it has arrows. It doesn't have um, a rooster on it. There are other symbols that have deep theological significance, and we will explore those together on a different Sunday. So if you look up at ours, you're not going to find a, a rooster. But in many churches, including the church that I attend in Ipswich, there is a rooster on top of the church. But why? Why? We know that the rooster was important because it marked the passage of time. It marked the transition from night to day. It was important in keeping time at the temples for many of the ritual acts. And as one of the things that came up again at five o'clock on Friday as we talked was that the priests were the keepers of time in their culture. They actually set the time when the mar you know, how, when day began, then things could happen. You could get up, you could open the market, you could go to work, you could begin your day, you could pray. And so the keepers of time begin with the rooster. But it's not just a mark of night to day, it's the mark of denial. And it's the mark of forgiveness. In the story, the post-resurrection story that mirrors the three denials of Peter, he's then asked three times if he will tend to Christ's flock. And three times he says, yes, my Lord, yes, I will take care of your flock. Why do you keep asking me this? I said yes. But that yes is the chance to redeem the acts of denial that took place right before the death of his beloved leader, his beloved companion and rabbi and the son of God. And in that symbol of the rooster is the turning, is the turning, the repentance that we too will do today when we take communion together. We will confess we will come into relationship with God and make ourselves vulnerable as Christ did when he did not call himself a fox, but a chicken, a hen, and laid himself open, gave himself over in protection and love, not by fighting, but by loving enough to put himself between others and harm. We will confess beneath the sign of the rooster today. And we will turn towards God and God's forgiveness and the possibility of forgiving each other when we have hurt each other and coming into a reconciled relationship and coming back into that sacramental place where we can imagine that we will have another potluck Super Bowl Sunday, and we will sit down together in sacrament. But until that happens today, we will share the sacrament of communion, and we will do so with hearts that we have opened to God's presence, with lives that we have placed into God's keeping, with souls that we turn and pray will also become the embodiment of the love that has been shown to us that forgives all and gathers us up again and again and again beneath those sheltering wings and loves us through everything. The final image, I don't know if there is one, but I, I'm hoping, yes! Um, we just got yesterday, Meg Phillips shared it Images from Honduras. So this is the final remembering of the sacramental love of God. This is a program that gathers up the children of Honduras whose parents cannot take care of them. From infants on up, they are living in 
a fostering situation with loving people where they receive food, clothing, education, and safety. And one of the programs that was begun was a chicken raising and an egg laying program. So you, if you're able to see on the screen here, um, there's a cage of chickens arriving and then they're in a nice big chicken coop and the children are learning to tend to them, be responsible for them. And this will also create, it will create both food, economic independence, and a sense of reciprocity and relationship and the ability to love something that is more vulnerable than yourself. The love of God is not simply an idea or a symbol on the roof over the entrance. The love of God is something that we pick up in our hands and we hold it gently that it might not break, but we hold it with confidence that it is something that we can pass along to others. And when our hand is empty, it will be filled again and again and again. And that when we are the ones who need that love, something will be placed gently into our lives when we least expect it from those that we least expect to offer us such love and remind us that we are beloved of God. Thanks be to God. Didn't want to miss out on those chickens from Honduras. This is the time in the service when we invite you all to remember that part of the way that we are in community is by supporting each other through the contributions that we make to the church. The church becomes the contact point for those who need our support, that need our light and our hope and our help. And the ways that you give to us, whether it's by giving online through jxncc.org or dropping off an envelope, in the front of the church because our doors are unlocked and open to you or mailing in your contribution we appreciate the ways that you give and this is the time in the service when we simply remind you that that act of giving is a form of commitment that helps us remain strong in these times and now my friends we turn to the sacrament of communion We first say that to all people, regardless of where you are on your faith journey, regardless of how you identify as a, by what faith you know God, by what lack of faith you know God, but that you have known love in your life. And this table and this sacrament is open to all people. You are welcome here. So again, if for any reason you don't have your sacramental elements, something to drink and something to pop in your mouth, whatever it might be, ice chips or bread or a biscuit, anything that you have, um, we are sharing elements today because all are welcome. We're going to put up on the screen the words to the Sursum Corda and Sanctus and I'm going to apologize to the people in the sanctuary right now because um, the printer at the church wasn't working, so I couldn't print the words for all of you. So if you sort of have it memorized, just go ahead. But please uh, unmute and let us say these words together so that we can have that sense of community. So <coughs> unmute yourself so that you can share. God be with you. And also, and also God be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the sky. Let us give thanks to God Most High. It is right, right. to give thanks and praise. Indeed, it is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto you, everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you, and singing, and Alan's going to play for us, so you're welcome to sing along if you'd like. Holy, 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 Oh, <laughs> 
Friends, we ask that you prepare first the bread or what element you might place in your mouth as a symbol of the body of Christ. And we recall again that the act of gathering, whether we do it in person or whether we do it here virtually on Zoom, is a sacramental act. It is how we share and remember the story that when Christ gathered with his followers, he blessed the bread and then he broke it. And in that breaking, he asked my brothers and my sisters, when you take of this element, when you take of this bread, do so in remembrance of me. So now, brothers and sisters, as we bless these elements together, take and eat and do so in remembrance of the one who loves you and shelters you under his wings. Brothers and sisters, this is a cloth that was prepared for us by the Chikanga community. So we remember our partner church in Zimbabwe, in the city of Mutare, the Chikanga church. And we give thanks always for their partnership and their presence among us. As this morning, we lift also our cups and we bless our cups. And we ask for God's presence. And we remember the story that Christ too poured out the wine. And he reminds us that the fruit of the vine, when poured out and when taken together, is a sacramental act. And we do so in remembrance of a love and a life poured out for us. And a love that comes back to hold us. Take and drink and do so in remembrance of Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, we place on the screen for you the statement of thanksgiving. We are not alone. God made us. We are not alone. We're not alone. We have each we other. Have each other. Can anything separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble, Can trouble pain, 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 No. In all these things, we win an overwhelming victory through the one whose love for us has been proven. Neither death, neither Amen. <laughs> to conclude the service, um, we're going to play digitally, just so you know, Alan, we're going to play the music digitally for the, the final.
following him. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. We're going to sing three verses. We will place those verses up on the screen for you. And you're welcome to be muted, but there is song leadership because this comes from our congregational archives. So you'll be hearing yourselves singing. put up the words for you and play a version of the benediction so that you have song leadership. And then Alan will play us out for the conclusion of the service. But right now we begin the benediction together. Mm -hmm. 